Like, I would never want to watch you, but I respect that you're mad good at drums. <laughs> you know what I mean? Thank you so much, everyone, for tuning in. This is another episode of the Scoped Exposure podcast. Um, today's guest is one that I'm very excited for. Um, someone that I've seen, you know, originally when, you know, I got put onto their band, it was very apparent to me that this person was more than just a musician who was playing in hardcore music. Uh, and someone that really um, is an artist that plays in multiple mediums and with a new Jesus Peace single out surprisingly at the very end of 2022. And, you know, uh, I, I wanted to do a, a, a second Jesus Peace uh, interview for uh, season three of the podcast. So without further ado, um, you know, the maniac behind the kit, uh, Lou of Jesus Peace. Dude, thank you so much oh, yeah. for coming and, and joining for a chat today. Yeah, of course. I'm really happy to be here. It's going to be cool. Absolutely. Uh, feeling good. Yeah. And um, I, I don't know if you want to disclose, because we're uh, a little geographically separated right now, not on the same mm. landmass. So uh, right now you're calling in because you're on tour right now, but not for Jesus. Nope. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, well, actually, my uh, I'm in Paris right now. So it's it's literally dark here. I, I can't see, but uh, it's completely dark here. It's uh, 6.10 p.m um my uh my partner lives here in, in oh. paris she's from france oh i see so um so it's actually like we go back and forth between new york and uh paris because she has a visa to be able to play because she that's her job she's a full-time dj gotcha. so um i i am here to play some shows but mostly i just like to come at least two three times a year to see a family and friends and i just also love being here yeah but yeah i have some i also have some shows uh djing tour is weird because it's not during the week it's only on the weekend so <laughs> you're not doing anything for five days and yeah and it's just like there's know, no may, tuesday the, matinee the dj that, shows no i wish that'd be fun <laughs> it, it would actually be nice to like play at like 7 p.m and just go home like a regular show would be right i, I guess i'm gonna get tired of it like playing at 2 a.m and shit like that oh it's yeah a lot. i i don't i think it's the the hardcore like um standards of a show ending by 11 and being like oh that's great and then you look at yeah. something like death metal that maybe those shows start at 11 and go till two but then in your case Ugh. the electronic shows start at two so it's kind of the yeah the snake they get there. good at two yeah two is pretty early yeah <laughs> yeah yeah um so lou obviously we're going to chat about you know jesus bees drums and a lot of electronic stuff before we chat anything music we have to check some bevs before we get into the episode. So it's tradition for the guests to go first. So tell me what you're going to be yeah. rocking liquids wise. Uh, in lieu of me being in Paris, I got an Oasis. <clears throat> it's not a bev that is known in the U.S. very much unless you're from maybe northern Africa or from France. Okay. Um, I, it could be compared as like uh, so when I was little, we used to go to like the, the corner stores in my little hood and we would get like uh, these like plastic like huggy drinks and that was like the little kid hood drink you know what i mean for lack of a better term the hood drink like there's a lot of them not just that one it's kind of like i don't know if you know like the meme where it's like oh flaming hot cheetos girls or something like that i think i've Maybe seen haven't. one or two uh, of those but uh i've never anyway, seen that bev before so yeah 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 so pretty much it's the it's the french uh hood drink and it's uh extremely good yeah tropical is what i'm drinking Oh, Oasis. okay. Tropical flavor, so it's a little bit yeah. of a little bit of orange, a little bit of other stuff. So yeah, and I, I and I hate tropical things, but this bev is especially so good. Okay. And then, yeah, if you like Oasis, definitely check out uh, Liptonic, Capri Sun here in France. Whenever you're here, don't just stick to the the classic bevs. Definitely branch out and uh, check out other stuff. So yeah, well, my, I, I definitely suggest Oasis. It's a it's a huge reason why I do this portion of of the podcast because uh, <laughs> the beverage side of me is always intrigued. Of like, I've never seen that before, uh, and I'm a firm believer. If you're in a new part of the world, definitely look. Try to find the local bevs. Don't just get your yeah, yeah, yeah. your bubblies and your Coca Colas. You know those are tried and trues, but yeah. you know gotta <laughs> gotta venture out. 
No, I'm get I'm getting the Coke. So they don't have uh, Diet Coke really here in France. They have the Coke Light, which I think is like a scam. I'm like, ah, oh, no. So I just stick to Coke uh, Zero. Coca Zero. Oh, okay. I drink it every day. It's like I don't drink or smoke, so I'm like, fuck it. I'm gonna drink a Coke Zero. Yeah, but they don't day. have Diet Coke in in France. So it, it kind of is the Diet Coke, but it doesn't taste. I don't know if you've ever been to Europe, but like a lot of stuff just does not taste the same as it does in the U.S. Mm-hmm. Obviously, because a lot of the U.S. stuff is like illegal here. Um, but yeah, uh, the Coca Zero is uh, way different than what it would taste like. So it's the, it's the most it's the most comparable to Diet Coke in mm-hmm. uh, U.S. Well, I mean, if, so, I, if someone can comment and correct me if I'm wrong, I could drink something else. But <laughs> as far as I know, I'm drinking Coca Zero. Yeah, I'd be very. Just, I know, uh, you know, partially a a, a PA, um, you know. Uh, neighboring band but i i feel like mark or, or sorry matt from from gridiron if if that band ever went over because that man lives off of diet coke so i feel like yeah. he he might suffer and gridiron might you know suffer nah, he'll be all right i'll put him on <laughs> yeah yeah for sure i'm sure there's people selling diet coke like real true american diet coke like um yeah they're probably the like five dollars five euros <laughs> yeah they're all imported <laughs> um so I appreciate you bringing something that's regional to you, beverage wise, because that's what I'm going to be doing for our conversation. So, yes. I'm going to be drinking. It's called the uh, the brand's called Vivu, and they do these I like. I've seen that. Yeah, it's like a light, sparkling mineral water. Um, I tried this like six months ago for the first time, and I was like hooked on it. Um, they're based. It- in. It looks like uh. So we have a. Do you guys have Trader Joe's in? No, we don't have Canada. Trader Joe's no? up in Canada. So it, it looks exactly like a drink that I I get from Trader Joe's. It's oh. not white label. It's like a green, like lime green label, but it has the same strawberry picture. Have, okay. The I'll strawberry to, like, pictures from like uh, like Don't Be <laughs> Stock or something. <laughs> yeah, but it's like so similar. Yeah. Well, uh, it's from Halifax, which is on the eastern side of Canada. Um, oh, and I'm okay. drinking the, the pressed ripe strawberries flavor. So I've only, I haven't that had this flavor before, good. but I've had, I think the blueberry one, which is fire. So, oh, well, cheers to that then. Cheers. Cheers to that. I was just about to <laughs> really excited to have you friend. Oh yeah. Yep. That's good. That's some real deal strawberry pick. shit. So, uh, Lou, I, I don't know if you got to hear any of the, the prior episodes to kind of catch the vibe uh, of our show, but any new guest that comes on who hasn't been a guest on our podcast before, I always like to get a bit of, you know, context about how they even just discovered heavy music in general. And, you know, okay. you're not someone that has done a huge line of podcasts. And I know I was listening to the one where you were on with Joe, um, where you kind of like really told the origin story so whether you want to do the cold notes version or the long version up to you just tell me about how you were discovering this whole world that um that people know you for originally uh um well i really have my i always just go back to my dad because my dad really he's not the thing is he's he's a hip-hop head like through and through like real hardcore hip-hop dude like and he also got me into djing too but um that's that's another story uh yeah, like when we, I remember when we were really young, we used to watch a Headbangers Ball. And this is like my earliest memory of like heavy music. And we were in the living room and Slayer was on. And, you know, the song, I think Ditto Head is what it was. And he was like, oh, we got to like mosh. He was teaching. We were just like pushing each other in the living room. And then like a Sick of It All track came on. And I wasn't that into it, to be honest. But I remember that was like my intro to like, okay, this is like, he, you know, first hearing the terms like moshing and stuff like that. Cause he was going to shows in the eighties and uh, where I'm from uh, at a venue called Oliver J's in Allentown. And he got to see like uh, butthole surfers, gorilla biscuits. I think he said he saw judge, but it's funny. Cause like for him, it was just like, cause he skated too. It's like what his friends were doing. And he was like, fuck it. Like I'll come too because it sounds hard. You know what I mean? Mm. Like I just want, he, he just wanted a reason to go crazy. Mm. So within that, he got to see some of the legendary things. And so, uh, yeah, that was my intro. And then he showed me Youth of Today later in the day. And then um, uh, my family has, like, a lot of uh, history with, like, uh, drinking and stuff like that. So he showed me what Straight Edge was. And he was like, don't ever drink. It's it's pointless. I was going to a thing called Boys and Girls Club at the time. And I think he was really afraid of me getting involved in the wrong things all the time. 
Mm-hmm. But I think I, he scared he scared it out of me. Because I remember <laughs> before I went to the Boys and Girls Club, which is like a place that like young kids go, like like kind of like community, it's like a community center. Mm-hmm. But like and they like play pool or like play basketball. And he like I went there my first day with X's on my hand. Yeah, that that you didn't draw was. on, right? It was him, right? No, he he drew it on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which as I, you know, I'm sure there's I I have a few friends that are just new into parenthood, and some are straight yeah. edge and some are not. But I'm like, that's <laughs> such a a life hack just 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 draw x's and be like sorry yeah just like <laughs> just you're, you're marked now mm-hmm. like but uh yeah and since then i've been straight edged my whole life uh whether i knew it or not so mm. um and then from there i just uh i got really into uh, punk music uh the exploded was like my favorite band in eighth grade and casualties and stuff like that and then a local band called common enemy i went to go see a lot um and i really liked the circle pit it's weird because my my town was like in between a lot of big cities. It was an hour from Philly, an hour and a half from like New York City, and like near like Renex, New Jersey. It's like a lot of places where pe- people in those major places went when it was too expensive, or you know, I don't know. It was, it's a weird like a uh, hub of a lot of things, mm-hmm. and that that goes to say for a lot. Like even in my high school, there was a lot of different uh, kinds of people, like people from Dominican Republic. Uh, people from the Bronx, people from Philly, and stuff like that. So I, I, I got to see a wide range of things. And I'm able to relate on a lot of different uh, levels with people yeah. because of that. So I'm I'm happy. But same goes for like uh, for heavy music because um, there was a hardcore scene. But uh, when, I, when I started going to shows, there wasn't too much. Because uh, I was so into punk, I wasn't really excited to like go to this place called like Rock Rock, which is where all like the... It's like the origins of like Dave and Aaron and stuff in the band. Okay. It was like it was what I called at the time because I was pretty like I wanted to be mad elitist like punk and I was like nah I would never pay I would never pay to play like that's bullshit I'm not selling tickets or or paying twenty dollars or fifteen dollars for a show never right so I started going to like this like local like art space that was like really intense like politically. It's like where I learned a lot of my everything that's pretty like prominent now in uh and pretty common to talk about like feminism and and uh the masculinity and things like that was like very early in like my my origins of going to shows and it was really confusing to me because I was like why I wanted to hear heavy music go crazy not like have like a class so like before like the shows and stuff they would sometimes like read from like books and stuff like that and it was cool i mean it wasn't <laughs> You're like i can't was, mosh was, to, to this person just reading yeah the, the back spine then, of this book yeah it was you know i don't want to talk shit on it because it was it was actually it's where i learned a lot about how to i don't know i, I learned to, how to approach things didn't see things differently it, like i i learned what being a vegetarian or vegan was sure. at a really early age and uh anyway i was playing shows there and then uh it's mostly just like real experimental like punk like we had like a lot of bands from like europe coming in like i remember this band called kaika scoop and sukoputo playing how in the world do you even spell that (laughs) i don't know it's really long and then they were like a dv band Mm. from what i remember and i so i never i never got like the real 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 deal uh like authentic hardcore until i went down to philly okay you know and that that took years for me because i didn't have a car mm-hmm. or i can i never had one so i uh, once when i started getting more friends in allentown that were more into that and uh we start I, the first time i went to a philly show was this is hardcore 2011 or 10 because my favorite band ever youth of today was headlining mm-hmm. and it was like their first show and like forever so I, like i was like oh i need to go to this so uh i think i drove down with my, my high school girlfriend in like ninth ninth or tenth grade Mm -hmm. and yeah and that was my intro to philly and philly was really really uh, eye-opening because it was like prime time like uh i mean right you know right now it's a really prime time for philly too but in 2011 it was really scary like i legit was i was i'm not gonna lie i was really scared which i think is good i was uh, it was not like a a scary where i was like wow i'm never gonna come back it was a more like damn like Cause I thought I was like, you know, I know everything in Allentown. Like nobody can really be more like intense than what it was. Cause you know, we were like crazy in these punk shows, mm-hmm. but nah, even like, it was my first time seeing, it was like prime time. Like I think nails played, title flight played, you could today played all like kind of in the line, I think. Mm-hmm. And I think H2O or something played too. I don't remember the lineup from that year, yeah. but yeah, I was getting, 
I was getting super fucked. Yeah. Like I was fucked up. <laughs> I was just like wanted to be in the pit, but I was like like even skinnier than why I am now. And I remember nails started, and I was like, whoa. And I actually never even got into nails, but that, that time I saw them, it was really, really impressive. And just yeah. being there was super impressive. So, And then from there, um, I mean, I, we can go on the line, but that that was really my intro to, like, hardcore, hardcore. Like, yeah. seeing it live, like, in, in the flesh. Well, I would go to Wilkes-Barre a lot, too, before I started going to Philly. I was, I was kind of going in between. But, I, but my first, first, first one was this hardcore 2010 or 11. I forget what year it was. But that yeah. was my first intro to real deal. Uh hardcore and heavy music yeah and and i and there's been a lot of other people who have come on the podcast where they talk about like their one of their earliest show experiences and the intensity and the veracity and the the violence and Mm. there there are people it's a very flight or fight response because there are people that are like you know they're like yep that shit isn't for me and i'm never going back to a show again and then there's something within a certain cast of characters who are like this is my shit and i need this right. and this is like my lifeline to a lot of the things to be able to either express myself or deal with the traumas that i have in my my upbringing um and and for a multitude of other reasons but um yeah it's it's wild to see to hear yeah. that you were kind of not like musically it wasn't hitting you initially but seeing it in person was like connecting a lot of dots. No, no, no. I loved it. I mean, I, I went to heavy shows before that. Like I, I saw System of a Down in like 2005 sure. and like went to like stuff like that. But like for like, I always loved hardcore and I, it's all I ever wanted. It's like I, all I wanted with the, at, the, at my like DIY space was to see a band like you could today. All I wanted was sure. to see like a real deal hardcore band. But they wouldn't come because they were all, they, because hardcore was too macho to come to those spaces. You oh, know what I, I mean? see. Okay. That that was the thing. I you know, and I couldn't have access to go to Philly or Wilkes because I wasn't driving, and they're two, they're an hour and a half away. Mm-hmm. So I'm like, unless I have friends that are willing to go up there with to take me, I I have no access. Right. So it was something that I saw from afar, and all I wanted was like, please, like this art space, please have one show, like where like I can see like real moshing, and I'm, mm-hmm. it's not just me like trying to like getting yelled at because I'm like throwing my arms and stuff. And like, <laughs> you know, it was like, it was funny. Like I was like, I was the macho one at some point at the, at the secret arts base. And I'm like literally like five ten, one thirty five 135 at the time. <laughs> so like, you know, and then when I went to Philly, I was like, yeah, this is all I wanted. And I, I you, got, you were a quick. stick compared to like the, the tree trunks of people that were thrown in the, pit. Oh my God. I was, <laughs> I was humbled extremely, extremely fast, but I love that. I mean, I always right. love, be humbled it opened up a whole new can of worms and and from there i was going to philly and uh and wilkes Bear pretty much every mm-hmm. weekend yeah yeah to see a lot, so, of, a lot of shows so well, I, as much as i could i appreciate you correcting the record so it was it was you were interested in the music but just where you lived and the i guess the standard as as far as a diy show was a little bit more punk and you were just seeking something more and that this is yeah or was, was the the breaking into into that new world well, was the breaking of a, like a, the, what I see like, as authentic, like just, you know, if you want to see hardcore, this is where you go. Gotcha. And that's art space. The art space, I really don't want to, I don't want to make it seem like it was like shitty because it was awesome. They were bringing a lot of experimental acts. They're bringing a lot of things that I wouldn't normally see unless I was in that time and place, which right. I appreciate because it really, it, it actually influenced how I look at writing music for Jesus Peace and how I am today. Yeah. You know, if I was just like, if I was just listening to just, uh, you know, like classic hardcore all the time jesus peace would be a very different band and oh, totally. uh everything i do and me as a person would be very different so yeah. definitely don't want to take that for granted i I really love that i was having access to both things yeah i don't think any of us are are, are uh you know talking shit on this place i think everybody's even if it's not the conventional cool or like you know it connects with where you are on, on your musical journey today i think every step and everything connects to that overall spider web of, of how to get you here. Because arguably, without having those, you know, DIY shows at this art space, you know, you might just get bored of just going to shows in general, and then you might yeah. have been off to doing something else, and Jesus Beast would not exist as a band, you know? Like, right. I think exactly. every every step of of that story matters. Um, yeah. let's, let's fast forward a little bit to, like, when you actually started to play drums. Um, like, did you come from a musical family or did, were you seeing other drummers and that was uh, catching your eye? Like, tell me about like the, the, the genesis of that. 
So I started playing drums before I started going to shows. My, um, I, like, as I said, I was really into System of a Down in like 2005, 2006. And around that time, my parents, uh, my dad got me a, a drum kit from the pawn shop mm-hmm. um, as, a, as a, a Christmas gift. And uh, I just, I pretty much, I learned to play drums on boxes because um, just copying System of a Down songs. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and I had a really big obsession with like always wanting to be in marching band in high school and stuff so um yeah it's kind of where it started um i guess my my drumming idol at the time was like joey jordison Hmm. um still is i I think he was rest in peace i think he was always i don't know i I think because he was more than just a drummer for me i thought i I just liked the way he looked and it was just influential to me in general Hmm. um but yeah yeah a, a punch up drum kit playing in the basement uh and then i made and then i and then i stopped playing drums for a while i don't know i don't remember why and then i I started going to shows and then i was like i saved up i was working at kmart and i saved up uh money to get a new drum kit i got a tama and i made a a, my first band uh was called slums okay and that was like in that was in like 2008 i think or something i forget what year it was Mm -hmm. but yeah that was my and that was that's when i then I just was pretty much just copying beats. I was just doing everything that uh, the drummer system of Down was doing, uh, the drummer of Exploited and SSD and all that. I was just trying to just really just learn those punk beats, and I just mastered them. And yeah. that's how I taught myself how to play drums. Yeah. So um, we're going to skip over, like, the Jesus Peace origin because when Aaron was on the show, we talked a bit about that. And I want to fast forward a little bit here because um, uh, what I found interesting on – on Joe's interview with you was you talking about when Jesus Peace started, you weren't like, I don't really know how to like hardcore drum. And it was like, well, do you know how to do like slam and, and this shit is like, yeah, it's like, okay, just drum like that. Um, yeah. Well, that's, yeah, it's true. Uh, if you listen to the first recordings of Jesus Peace, I'm really still learning how to play like that. Like, to be honest, like I just was not good. If you look at the early videos, like I'm look at our first, this is hardcore. And then look at my last drum video. I hate watching those, but you'll see you'll see the the, the improvement and the and the the confidence of me playing. I just I I, I knew, only knew how to play like D beats and like a two step beat, and that was really like it to be honest. I mean, I'm not gonna like shit on myself. I, I I could play stuff, but I was just not. I'm not I'm not like a taught drummer. You know, I'm not like technically like the most insane like jazz. Like that's just not me. But I love to play, and I love to play hard. So that's that's kind of was like okay enough. I was good enough to like start Jesus Peace, and I and I it's true I did like Slam. I was really into Devourment, and all that stuff. So um, Dave was like, yo, like if you want to make something heavy, I'm down. I'm like I'm down. Like I can play blast beats. I can play all this. So we'll make it work. And yeah, the yeah. first re- <laughs> the first recording you can definitely hear um, uh, <laughs> getting through it. But, yeah, but it- know, but it's. It's interesting, like, to hear you say, you know, like, I don't think I'm the best drum in the world, but, like, I love to play. And I think that, like, I know there's a lot of people listening to this would be like, well, lose a fucking beast on the kit. But I can tell that whether you're having, like, you're, like, Super Saiyan, you're, like, on it, or maybe you're having an off day during a set, you are just having like the time of your life while you're playing like your facial expressions like how you're carrying yourself like and if anything i feel like that makes like that's almost as important as playing good because yeah someone that films bands uh like sunny does and has done like music videos like when i see the drummer like kind of just like like they could be technically proficient out there butthole but when they just look like they're just bored on the set it kind of like kills the like bro you're the backbone and you're like yeah. leading into yeah. this like awesome part and you're just kind of just like yep it's, here we are so um <laughs> yeah i really uh, sorry no i was just gonna ask like were, were you seeing that with other drummers as far as like oh like i need to express myself or did, did that just come naturally when the live aspect of things started for jesus peace uh it came before i used to be in like this like black metal band and like we used to be really emotional <laughs> like so i felt like anytime i was playing i'm like dude if i'm not like giving it everything then what's the point because it's like mm-hmm. i'm not having fun just playing like these the same three beats because like with, with this one band i was in i was just playing blast and like a fast beat so i was like well 
like, dude, I want to like feel this too. I, like I want to be out there. Like I wanted this energy that I'm giving out. I want to feel it back at me. So there's no one can do that for me. No one can do that besides me. So, mm. um, and, and like, I think of it like with, with skateboarding, it's like some dudes might be the most insane skaters ever, like can do every trick, but that doesn't make them everyone's favorite skater because it's what, it's everything that surrounds it. And like the way they look and style and everything, it's like mm. so important. And some people have it and some people don't, but some people have preferences on how they like to play and how they, or how people like to view their drummers. Like some people just couldn't watch someone really like who looks maybe bored, but is insane. Like I really respect people like that. I really respect kids in like the death core and metal core scene. I don't know anything about that scene, but I really respect them because they are really good at their instruments. <laughs> like legit. Right. Like all those kids who are doing like covers of like whatever band, like, dude, it's like, I'm like, holy shit. Like, I used to work at Guitar Center. I don't know if you know this, but me, John, and Dave used to all work at Guitar Center mm -hmm. at the same store. And it's how, kind of how Jesus B started. Uh, well, right before it. And um, kids used to come into the drum room and be like, hey, can I get some sticks? I was like, yeah, sure. And it was like just these mall, like, kids would go to the mall, but they like, you know, uh, like Chelsea Green and all that stuff. But they were insane. They could play mm -hmm. like the most insane, like Meshuggah B and stuff like that. And like, like, I would never want to watch you, but I respect that you're mad good at drums. <laughs> you know what I mean? And, and, I, can, and I can really learn from that because right. I think there's a good middle ground. But, but yeah, on both sides. Because it's also not – I mean, like, some punk drummers, like, I don't even know who I saw. One time I saw – I think it was Firewalker I saw. I forget who it was. It doesn't matter. The, the drummer of some band that I saw, and she, uh, she was, you know, obviously not a, a drummer – but she was giving it everything. And that to me was just like, dude, that was so good. Mm -hmm. It was, it was really, it was really, really sick to see. Yeah. Um, so you brought up uh, the drum cams that, you know, you may or may not go to, to review, um, you know, and I think to, to go to your point, as far as like, I think Philadelphia as a whole had the perfect kind of like trifecta of things <clears throat> to make it really, um, just explode especially in like the the early 2020 to early t 2010s because you had a band like jesus peace that was pushing boundaries in that metallic hardcore like with like hints of metal um in the midst of that you had uh this is hardcore fest which is this big gathering of people um to to celebrate hardcore and you had someone like sunny to be able to document and put those things out and i feel like yeah, that true. combination like really push things into the ethos um and just to like push things out so i i think it's pretty safe to say that you just because sunny's local to you you know sunny's gone on tour with jesus peace multiple <laughs> times i feel yeah. like you probably have the most drum cams of just you <laughs> on the internet i i think i think i can make that uh that claim um honestly i don't know yeah, you might be right. Yeah. I never thought of that, actually. Like, I, I think that there might be other people that maybe do one-off covers or songs. But, like, when you're thinking yeah. of full sets, I, I think it's you. No, I, I, you're, you're probably right. You're definitely right. Mm -hmm. uh, as far as Hate 5 6 goes, he's, he's the one constantly filming everything. Uh, well, like, the one of the first ones to do it mm -hmm. uh, for, like, the longest time. Now there's a lot, including you and stuff. So that's – and. Even like your drum cam, I, I, you filmed us at Wild Rose, yes. right? <laughs> yeah, so, I was yeah, gonna bring up remember that our one. our drum cam of you because I think yeah. it was like second song in, and I didn't realize I only realized this in the edit uh, because you know, like just to pull back the curtain a little bit, I'm like it's a few days after Wild Rose 2019. I'm like, okay, I know that people are going to want to see Jesus Peace. Uh, I was already getting messages where the Jesus Peace said, I'm like. I have four cameras to cut and, and audio to, to track, like, chill out. And I'm going through the drum cam. It's, like, second song in. And then I'm, like, a few a few minutes later, I'm, like, why is the drum cam, like, off? Like, it's at – it feels like someone, like, like, uh, like swiped it with their hand or something. And then I realized that, I guess, like, mid-breakdown, just before, like, a big drop, you grabbed this little, like, GoPro-style camera, like, looked into it flipped it off and like threw it back and went into it like it was i don't <laughs> it's still one of my like i think i think i was dming you being like yeah sorry i can't give you a full drum cam that's properly composed but i think that was like one of the coolest things to make that set um that's so funny i don't know if you I remember honestly, that moment while you were playing it 
uh no 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 i remember because i remember I remember I was like, I don't know if this thing's on, but I, I thought it was off. So I was like, fuck it. Cause I, I would never mess with like anyone's stuff. I don't want to mess up your, your setup. Cause I think that's rude. But like, I was like, oh, well, you know, it'd be fun to interact with it. Like mm-hmm. if it is on and I don't know, sometimes I'm like, I, I can't, you know, I can't be out there engaging with people or, right. or I'm not going to be throwing sticks at people or something like that. So like I can only engage with what's around me and myself. Like I either like, you know, can, I can hit up my drum key really hard, or I could just go like literally like I don't know. Yeah. I don't, I honestly sometimes it sounds mad like corny, but like sometimes I just straight up just like do whatever. I don't even know what I'm thinking when I'm playing. I'm just like fuck it. Like, it's just like I want to feel like something, you know? Like all day, like I waited for this moment. I'm gonna give it everything I have. Like mm-hmm. even if the even when I'm sick or whatever. But yeah, I, I do. I actually do remember that, and I'm sorry <laughs> that I that I fucked up your camera. Well, I, I it. Is it fair to say that the that's angle. the only drum cam that maybe you have grabbed and interacted with? Oh, for sure. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. Okay. Um, some, <laughs> yeah, sometimes I'll look at the camera because I, I think breaking the fourth wall is fun. And I'm not I'm not going to be like, I agree. I'm gonna the camera's not here. Like, mm-hmm. I don't care. Like, we all know we're being filmed. Like, let's just have fun with it. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, yeah, that's the first one I ever, like, grabbed. Because I honestly, it was like, it's a GoPro. It's, I didn't think it was on. And yeah. <laughs> I love that you're like I don't know if this is on, but if it is, like let's just have some fun with it. Because I I straight up did not even know. I was like, "Eh, whatever. Let's just like give it everything. It's very cool. But I I do appreciate you saying that because I think that is a common thing that I and I'm sure Sunny experienced as well. Still to this day, where there's especially on the drum cam side because like that when you have a three to four camera multi cam thing, and and you know this as well because you've helped Sunny film. This is hardcore. Uh, a couple yeah. of times not just once uh yeah, yeah i think only for two years i did but okay. only for like a day or two at a time okay yeah but like when yeah. you have enough cameras at least my mindset is like someone's strap comes undone or like a vocalist drops the mic nine times out of ten you can maybe cut to a camera where you might not see it and it's like in the preview but the drum cam when it's a dedicated full drum cam set all the stick drops, all of the, you know, uh, symbol stuff, all of that is like, it's like, you know, right there parents. So as someone who's probably has the most amount of drum cam sets online, it's cool to hear your perspective of like, no, it's just, we're, we're here to have fun. And like, you know, let's just make the best of it. And that's not like baby, you know, this performance as being a maker, make or break for the band. Uh, do you have any thoughts there? Um, I definitely, I love to take it really serious. I'm not like, you know, like, fuck it. Like, who cares if you fuck up? I really, I actually, I'm really hard on myself when I play. Um, and if I'm, if I'm dropping a stick, it doesn't bother me, but it, it more annoys me to like be messing up. It's not like, oh, like it, this is going to leave a, a lasting effect on us. Cause I think we have a level of professionalism now where we just like, know, and we, 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 we feel it now. Cause we've, I mean, we've experienced, we've played a lot of shows but it's more annoying for me personally to be like messing up or dropping a stick or, you know, a symbol just like falls. Cause, cause you're right. There's really no room for error for drums. Cause there's only one of them. And it's one of them. It's like, you, as you said, it's the foundation of the song. So mm-hmm. I have no issue playing the songs. It's just more like a little mess ups or if it hurts or for instance, our first show back after the pandemic, uh, well, that was the gridiron you know, release show, I think. No, it was the. Um, it was like a benefit they had. It was like the barbecue in Pennsylvania. Oh I yes, forget. okay, yeah. Yeah, it was like my first drum cam back. Like it was our first show back, hmm. and it was so hot, and I really felt the effects of not playing for so long. Because hmm. I don't know if you know this, but I live in New York in Brooklyn. Right. But my kit and everything is in Philly. So if I do have to practice, I have to go to Philly. So I don't actually, I don't get, I don't play at all. I rarely play. So when I do play, it's only with the band. Hmm. So it's, uh, you know, after not playing for, I don't know, almost two years or more, I, it was a really humbling, awesome moment because it was extremely hot. Mm-hmm. I could barely get through some tracks. Um, I was playing some fills I've never played. You know, sometimes I get surprised uh, what I can and can't do. And, uh, and that show was definitely a challenge for me. And I, you know, it made me be like, oh yeah, I gotta, I gotta get back into this, because you can't just like hop up and just, 
I thought I could just, uh, no problem. I don't have to really work on it or hmm. play again. I, I, they're my songs, so fuck it. Like, I can do it now. So and my songs taught me a, a lesson. That's very interesting because, again, talking about the amount of drum cam sets that uh, Sonny has, and I just checked it here. I think it's from that show, July 10th, 2021. Um, I think so. It, that's the most amount of uh, views out of any of the other drum cam sets. Um, that's crazy. Yeah, and and I don't know, like I don't know if that's specific to the timing because y- you can look at, you know, this is hardcore 2018, which is th- like three years old versus that other video is only one, but that only has thirty thousand. So that's just interesting. That uh, I think if I had to make a guess, I think the reason it has more views is not because you're playing better or worse or anything like that. I think it's because Sonny had like that tracking um, oh, yeah, set up, yeah, yeah. which yeah. I thought was like super cool that he started to do that. But I don't know if he doesn't do that anymore because it's just like a huge rig to set up, but um, it's probably just really annoying. Yeah. He's always doing like tests and stuff and he's also insane. Mm-hmm. I know. I think you interviewed him before yeah yeah he's been on before um i think i've been bugging him as many other podcasters has like uh to to do a follow-up about like all the rage stuff um yeah i I was playing a fest that he was filming uh in november in oklahoma and uh i was talking to him about it and he's like i've been hit up so much for anything that i haven't even like fully processed that yet so it's like i'm not even ready to talk about it but no i understand that for sure yeah yeah, but it's just interesting to see how, like, you know, um, you know, there's so much for, you know, I'm sure, like, people who are trying to learn Jesus Peace songs or just, like, um, just trying to figure out different parts, but also can just, like, be entertained by you just, like, having fun and doing what you do best. Yeah, one thing to say about that is that if you're trying to learn a Jesus Peace song, this is this goes to anybody who's listening who may be a drummer. Do not listen to the live one if you want to hear uh, what I'm actually playing. Because I don't think it's fun to play the same thing over and over again. So every show I'm playing feels different. I'm playing faster or slower. Mm. I don't think that anyone's interested in hearing exactly what they heard on the record all the time. If you could play something cooler, like we'd love to slow things down, speed them up, or I'll play a fill I've never thought I could play. Mm. We, I, I just think that we do like... I don't know. We're just like uh, we're trying to make it interesting. It's, yeah. it's what's it's not that fun to just be like, okay, well, let's just like play exactly what's on the record every single night. It's like, dude, I've been playing like shows for like thirty days straight. Like, I'm gonna like play this faster. I'm gonna play it slower. I'm gonna do this fill, this fill, this fill. I don't mm. know, but yeah, um, that's another thing. People, I think, watch and are probably like, wait, this sounds way different than what he's doing. Yeah, on I the think record. I think there's one song specifically off the demo that it's so weird to listen to like now because live you guys play it at like almost like uh 1.5 speed you know com- compared oh, yeah, to yeah, yeah. the original um how many of those i guess decisions on the fly are like within the practice space of jesus piece like like yeah this part is gonna be faster or whatever and how much of that is you like like all right eyes on me we're doing this a little <laughs> bit slower <laughs> It depends. Like if like some of the new songs that we we already have been switching them up, even though they're not out yet. <laughs> yeah. <Are you> serious. <laughs> yeah. Like uh, the the song that's gonna come out uh, in a few weeks. Not anyone knows that. Actually, this is the first time I'm saying it's publicly stated. Uh, a song is coming out in a few weeks with okay. a video. But anyway, that song is uh, we already like added some stuff or slowed stuff down. The offering to the night, we we slow apart down live. Um, sometimes we're just like, fuck it, this would sound cool. Sometimes we'll be playing the song and I'll just mess around and be like, yo, what if it, we just did that? Like me, me, Dave and John specifically are so good at uh, kind of knowing how to like, it's like a workout like trifecta ball. Sure. Anthony is just a good at following along and Aaron just does him. He's just a beast. So um, we're, we just like, if I slow it down, they know to follow. I don't know. It's, 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 an, it's nice being able to play with people who you can connect with like that. Cause you can just make it really interesting. Oh, like, totally. Whatever you want. Yeah. Because yeah. yeah, I, 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 I love where bands can look at older stuff that they've done and they're like actually doing this faster or adding a break here or changing it up a little, like makes it that much more interesting. And, and if anything yeah. keeps that song 
more and more relevant as the band progresses and writes new music. Um, Exactly. But at the same time, like, you know, hardcore, like, doesn't come from this place of, like, jazz or, like, that, like, freestyle (laughs) nature, but there is a lot of there is such a strength to be able to play with people that you can understand when something changes or, or even on the sake of like, Oh, like buddy's guitar went out. I'm going to be playing, you know, their yeah. lead parts or whatever. And you don't have to have like pause, have a conversation about it. You just have that telepathic, you know, discussion yeah, yeah. and you, you know, the train keeps rolling. If you look at any of the live shows, the people, if I, if I mess up, Dave does this thing where he goes, and like snaps at me, looks, and I had to literally tell him like, stop doing that, please. Like it's <laughs> <laughs> like we know, we know I dropped a stick or something, and but uh, I know we like give each other looks, and we just like no, I don't know. Mm-hmm. It's weird because that way we function as a band is not how we function on stage. We're like kind of like we're all hard headed as individuals, and we can kind of like argue a lot off stage, but on stage we literally are so unified and hmm. uh it just like is a is a unit. Like we all have we know we all know what to expect and what to give. And there's no there's really no discussion about it, truly. Um maybe the only discussion is to like get Aaron to maybe speak up on uh new stuff or to promote promo stuff. But he's so in the moment sometimes that he's just like like let's just keep going. Let's just keep going. I'm like, no, nah, but we have to tell him that we wrote something new. Like, <laughs> we have to at least do that. Yeah. Like, I don't know. I, feel like I, I think in the in the the Wild Rose Tour 19 set, there's a moment where you know, like I, I I love Aaron, but I think there was a moment where he was like, I'm gonna I'm gonna dedicate this next song to Canadian weed, and that there was like five people were like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, he loves he yeah. loves weed. That's something I would definitely be like. That's something we would argue over, for instance. I'd be like, you didn't have to say that. Yeah, bro, we, we don't need to plug <laughs> weed. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> yeah, but uh, he'd just be saying whatever sometimes. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, we definitely have our, like, t- talks and conversations about all sorts of stuff. But, sure. But, yeah, as I, as I said, as a unit, um, playing, you know, it's, a, it's, it's very liberating because it feels good to yeah. so, uh, not have to worry about that. So Jesus Peace as a unit, obviously there's a new record coming down the pipe, some new music. Um, but if you're looking at like only self and behind, uh, I always like to ask this question for people that have a lot of, you know, songs that have a certain amount of buzz or, or things like that. Tell me, in your opinion, what is the most overrated Jesus Peace song and what's the most underrated Jesus Peace song. Mm, that's tough. Uh, and again, you're coming at this as a drummer, so you know Aaron's take on this could be different. Like, I don't really like vibe with these vocals as much, or like I put a lot of effort into like this song specifically, but it just didn't connect. So, as a drummer, what song are you like? You look at the set list, and it's like oh, I gotta fucking do this. But like I know it's um, for the people, but like for my body and my legs, it's uh, I would rather not. And what's the opposite? I, I don't often think about stuff as like a drummer because I think it's I I like to think of it. We always think of writing stuff as like how does this sound better with the band in a, in a whole? Because I, I, like even now I'm not like really looking at drummers being like, yo, this dude is so sick. Like I want to steal like his things because I I don't know. I think it's like not that interesting. But as as a, I think we all feel the same as a unit. I think that we, we might all have different answers, but like I know that in some way we all have our different opinions about it. But as a drummer, um, I think the most overrated song is honestly, it's a good song, but I, I, I think it's, uh, I think we can, I wish we could stop playing Oppressor all the time just because it's not, I know, I know people would be surprised by that answer, but I think it's like, um, I wish we can write a part two to it, and maybe we will, hmm. that can continue on from what that was. I think that people really love that song, and the lyrics are amazing. But uh, but literally, as a drummer, it's so annoying to play. Because <laughs> it's the most... <laughs> it's literally... I wrote it like when I first started playing like with Jesus Peace, hmm. and it's literally the most like pointless... Like we have like a part, like we actually have just discussed, we'll never, we'll never stop playing it, but mm-hmm. we have a part where I think we're going to end it after, you know, the big oppressor part, because the rest of the song is literally pointless. There's no vocals. <laughs> it's just a blast beat. And like, like a whole skate part. That's like, you can tell you, we were just like mad young and just like mm-hmm. trying to write something. Um, it's just like poorly written. 
But that's that's strictly talking about drumming. I would I would not want to play a presser. Like super uh it was tiring and like <laughs> like like after we're doing like the sick ass part and we were all feeling like really good about that, and then I'm like, Oh, okay, now I have to go to this pointless like and it's so taxing to play that. I, um, I like the idea of like like this is the climax of the song. We don't need the fucking outro like post yeah. like you know part of the the story like let's just end it here i like that for the next tour we're actually writing like a, a medley of our all of our uh some of our older songs that people oh, love want to hear interesting but maybe but maybe uh this is not i don't even know if this is supposed to be publicly said but um yeah we're gonna like combine three songs uh because like conjure life for instance is like a really like sick intro we you know we wrote a whole intro for conjure life that was never originally a part of the song on mm. the record yeah if you see us live we play a whole thing that's not a part of it and we're just gonna blend that with the presser or blend something with the presser just to make it more interesting because we really are tired of playing the end for everybody is but me especially <laughs> uh underrated song um i'm not saying this as a drummer but i really think that uh I'm not going to say the people thought it was underrated, but us as a band, we, we should have played Lucid more. We never play Lucid live. Mm. It's, a, it's the opening track of Only Self. I think that we were all annoyed by it. I, we're, we're, not all, we're not at all fans of our old stuff. We're really excited to give everything new. Mm-hmm. I could say that for sure. Like everything on that, we play all, everything old, but we're really trying to filter out of it. But, uh, but that, I guess that's why we're always updating it and making it more interesting because uh, it's a... Uh, yeah, pretty redundant to play, mm-hmm. uh, but yeah, I think I think Lucid is a really underrated song, and um, uh, what's the other one? Anyway, Lucid. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I would I would I would have loved to play that a lot more. I think it's an awesome song. Mm-hmm. And uh, the I don't think that there's any other hardcore bands that I at least know of who are like trying to do medleys or combos of like a few different older songs. So I'm I'm very excited to to hear how that sounds um once you're yeah, we're, we're, and that'll be on the show me the body and scowl and zulu tour tour you know, yeah cool. yeah cool. Mm-hmm. yeah yeah are we hitting we're hitting vancouver right i think y'all are coming to vancouver but not to calgary so oh it's right you're in calgary yeah uh yeah i don't think we are <laughs> damn that sucks oh, well. maybe i'll have to try to find a way to to come through to see that medley yeah, you have to you have to fly or something <laughs> um so i think one of the other things um that i wanted to hit on is you you kind of talked about it on some of the other podcasts that i was listening to and now it doesn't even feel apparent and it's not even in anyone's vocabulary but i think when jesus peace was first starting like i think y'all like really had to go through a lot of unnecessary um grievances on people like being like oh like Jesus Beast is in a hardcore band. Um, they're like too much this. But like, if you look at nowadays, like the hardcore spectrum touches d- like death metal, like it touches like D beat. It, it touches all these places, but it still is considered hardcore because of the people, the way people are moving to um, the music, the way like the members themselves, like coming from hardcore bands as well. So did Jesus Beast take all that heat? so that all the other bands could run supposedly or like when you think about that time like how important was that or was it important for the band to to you know grow some thick skin um i think there was a lot of people who thought we weren't gonna go past our demo Hmm. honestly i we were we i really am happy with how we dealt with a lot of the flag towards us because it, I think is what kept us around longer and kept us who we are. It kept It drove us for sure. Mm-hmm. I mean, I don't know. It's weird because we like, we talked about it, but it was not like something we like really heavily focused on. We weren't like, it was more just like, did you see that? Or did you hear that? It's like, yeah, well, whatever. Like, mm-hmm. and it was, I think at, at very first, it's like tough. Cause like, you know, you're excited to release something. And if, you know, you see people that you're excited to share with, maybe, uh, not t- taking it well. There's nothing I can do. I'm not going to force people. I don't think there's anything wrong with like being like this band sucks. It's like, well, if you think we suck, that's fine. I think it's like kind of boring to be like having to agree or say something nice all the time. It's like, okay, well, if you decide to go out of your day to tweet something about something or talk about something, but 
that's that's your prerogative but uh but to, to feel an opinion and how you don't like our music or do like our music it's that's fine that's i i appreciate that a lot i think a lot of i like i think a lot of bands face grievances uh it wasn't just us but um but it but to, to say this um i was listening to a 25 to life tape that i bought somewhere it was like a bootleg and in the in the recording you can hear rick to life saying i hear a lot of people talking shit about marauder saying they're not real hardcore and they're too metal for the scene but you know i fuck with them and they're in their new york i forgot exactly what he said but it's like so this has been happening since then and mm-hmm. probably before ssd went metal after they they released like their most like amazing album and people weren't fucking that they went metal it doesn't matter i mean i don't know i'm not for me it's just stuff like that just drives me i don't mm-hmm. I, I don't get affected by it. i'm not gonna get mad at someone because they don't like the band that's fine like there's a lot of my friends who don't are not into what I do or and the, but you know they they do their own thing. And there's a lot of there's a lot of things that I'm also not into either. Right. So I can understand both sides. It's it's not a big deal. And and we did our thing. The, the most proud of I'm really proud of us because we always just did our thing. Mm. And um, <clears throat> I know that Knock Loose de- dealt with a lot of that stuff. Yep. And to be completely honest with you, I was one of those people that was really not liking Knock Loose at all. Like, I was like, I don't understand who these kids are. I don't like the music that they're playing. And I truly don't believe that they're a part of the hardcore scene. And it, it took me to get to know them and understand them to be like, actually, these guys are actually genuine. They're very nice. Mm-hmm. And I think that they have a lot of sincerity that they want to offer something to the hardcore scene. It may not be the conventional sound. It may not be what you want it to be, but that's not the point. Yeah. And I love I love the idea of things moving forward and things driving. I understand people who want to who want to keep things authentic and and what they a picture to be like a hardcore scene and, and secure that because things can be exploited and shit on and and uh watered down and i understand both sides so um i don't blame anybody for like wanting to shit on jesus peace for being like this is not what hardcore is i'm like okay well that's how you feel but we're still going to be here no matter what you say or do because right. we're going to these shows uh this is our life you know what i mean like I don't know what else to say. Yeah. Um, well, you know, at the time when we started, it was literally everything to us. We were, we've, we've been going to shows for, I don't know, a very long time. Uh, now that I think about it, talking about going to shows in 09 doesn't seem like that long ago, but it really was a long time ago, kind of. Right. Um, but I don't know. I, I'm, I think that we, yeah, we face some flack and I think we still do, you know, even uh, within like our own, um, our own community sometimes. Mm-hmm. Um some some people don't like to see things go away that they don't want it to go and they have an opinion on it and that's that's okay everybody has opinions but yeah no matter what we're still here and we're gonna keep going yeah i i love the the sentiments of just like we just we weren't we didn't get lost in the sauce of like oh do we need to respond to this certain thing or do we no. need to have a conversation like we're just gonna do our thing and we're gonna do it super well and just become yeah. undeniable and I think I've faced like certain things, like whether it's like certain bands that I'm playing in or even just like doing this podcast or filming bands. Like I just had to get to a point where it's like if if everyone theoretically was fucking with something that I was doing, there's probably something wrong with like having yeah. that many people um, who are like saying yes to it. Like, I think you need to have some people that will be um not negative but like to to give you the opposite and not give you praise and i i love to see i think that there's two kinds of people where there's someone like yourself that might talk shit about a band but then come around to meet them and be like oh these dudes are genuine i fuck with them and you come Mm -hmm. around and there will be people that will come around but there will also be people that just like double down on their opinion and whether uh, you know things don't turn out like it's just kind of on them and that's the thing that i love with with hardcore and i heard you say it on 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 joe's podcast about like and and i'm gonna i'm using this as our segue into some of the electronic stuff but like hardcore Mm. was the only the first place where i didn't have to convince someone to care about it it was just like oh we put out music people cared about it and i think that's the beautiful thing is that like with this it's really you're just putting it out into like a community of people to be like is this cool is this podcast cool is this demo cool is you know or or is the way that i'm filming these bands cool and the people decide and locally you could have people scrutinizing you and talking shit behind your back 
But like if there are if you're building a community and a fan base off of whatever you're doing artistically, like let that speak for itself. Don't let the people who are just like downtrodding you that you might see at the local weekend show versus the hundreds of people that are listening to your music or tuning into whatever you're doing. So, right. yeah, I, I think artistically I think... it's it's just super important to just like stay in your lane and keep doing what you're doing and just don't like filter out any of of um, of the bullshit because, you know, I, you know, I, I, yeah, like I said before, it was, it was really driving for us to, uh, to kind of have some flack. It was the first time in my life that I actually had that on that level where it was like, you know, when you get a lot of exposure in some way, I'm not saying we're with this big banner or anything, but, uh, when you, when we, it was the first thing I put out that people cared about and that people actually had an opinion on, mm -hmm. you know, because, and it was like, kind of like a learning experience for us. It was like, Oh, we put out something and people actually paid attention to it. But also people hated it, but also really loved it. And it was like, okay, so how do we respond to that? And well, none of us really like to talked about it. Well, I mean, our rule was just we're not gonna like acknowledge that we're not gonna be fighting people or arguing about, you know, why don't you like us? It's like, wow, well, if I have to convince you to like us, it's like you know, I, I would rather jump off a building. Like, there's, it sounds like hell. But it, the the thing that I felt really good about is that we're we are naturally who we are there's never a time where i felt that we had to put on some sort of whatever you know um aaron is always him in uh in his in his funny weird way and date and, and how we wrote everything just was natural for us we never were like oh we wanted to be like this or you know because if we wanted to take the easy route we would have just wrote conventional things that was that was the sound of the time mm -hmm. and uh, i'm not sure I think we, I think we genuinely, like for real, just wrote stuff that we just like to hear, like legit. We're like, this just makes sense for us. And even if Jesus Peace didn't take off or whatever it did or didn't do anything, we would still be playing in bands. We would still be going to shows. We'd still be living our lives. So it's, it's not different for us. So I'm not really offended on the or or too hung up on like, oh, like what can I do to get people to like it? Because, because it's natural for me. It's not like I'm gonna. I, I've never once told myself like, oh, I would ever stop playing music if it didn't work out. Like, no, I'm. I'm I'm down to play bars if I have to. It just it gives me life to play music, and it gives me life to do something artistic, and it gives me a lot more life to do something in a community where I feel uh, I'm able to do what I want. That's the thing about hardcore is that I really didn't. I never thought it was about the sound coming from the scene I was coming from, especially like the DIY thing and everything. I really thought that it was all about pushing the limits, and it was more about how you kind of associated and supported things, and just like how straight edge is not just being sober. It's more than that, you mm -hmm. know. And that's what hardcore is to me. I never thought it was just, uh, well, you have to sound like this or, you know, I, I do, I do honestly believe that you need to do your homework. You do need to research the origins of everything and respect, or at least give it a chance and not just like, cause I, I do think there's a, a mass amount of people who are learning about it maybe through us or for turnstile or wherever. And that's great. But I do think there's a, a really strong foundation that you're missing. If you don't really understand the origins, there's a really big piece that you're missing. If you don't have that, that understanding at least of the yeah. foundation of where it is, where it's coming from. And maybe you're missing a part of the, the spirit from it. Yeah. And that, that to me, that to me is the saddest part. It's like, if you don't have the spirit of what hardcore was or is or where it came from, then, then you're kind of like shooting yourself in the foot. But, but at the same time, if you love music and you want to come to the show, sure. That's, that's cool too. But yeah. I do think that I do think there's a level of respect that you have to give and, um, you know, kind of time and effort that you have to make to mm -hmm. become like a sincere uh, attendee. Because there, I, I really do think that there's rules to this, and I, I do think that you have to respect. You don't, you don't have to, but if you don't, then you're you won't get the full experience. And yeah, me like co coming up as like a young kid and learning what it's, you know, what it's like to mosh and understand supporting shows and what it's like to to kind of put on for your friends and stuff like that. That stuff is all really important. I really only learned that like kind of feeling through being and going to hardcore shows. Mm -hmm. It sounds pretty generic, but it, but it's true. I think it's different than any other scene. Like in electronic, I kind of struggle with that because I'm not, uh, I'm not playing all the time or anything, but you know, there's like six different events happening in one night. And I'm like, damn, it's crazy. Cause like you guys are battling against people who are even your friends and like for shows, but it's just so different. And I'm like in hardcore, like we would either combine the shows or just kind of talk to, with the promoters and be like, you know, let's book this person this day so everyone can go to that show. And this, right, right. Yeah, you know, it's so different. So I look at everything from a hardcore standpoint where it's like, you know, we don't want to step on, each, on promoters' toes or we have to have a discussion on like the scene here in our city. And um, there's a lot of things in my life that I really carry that on with me. Hmm. You know, I, I don't know. So, sounds generic, but like, 
having that hardcore perspective um, when it came to starting to play electronic shows and doing all that, like, where was that, like, um, oh, I have a leading edge as far as having a mindset that maybe other people that don't don't have that hardcore background have? And where did that, like, hinder you, like, to, to your point of, like, oh, is this going to compete as, uh, as far as shows go? And people are like, no. Uh, uh, why would that compete? What do you mean by that, like a leading edge? Well, you know, like I, I do think that, um, you know, a lot of people when it comes to like, what is the one thing that I've learned most as far as doing hardcore is like that DIY mentality, not only just for like, okay, like uh, promoter canceled the show. How can we make sure these games play? Uh, we blew oh, yeah. a tire uh, on the highway. How can we still make the show tonight? Like that mentality um, has been a huge part for myself specifically as well as a lot of other people i'm sure listening to this and people that might come like i'm thinking about when cole from scowl came on the show uh th we were talking this is a few weeks after they went on that limb biscuit um uh, run of shows with them and he was just saying an eye-opening piece for him was there are people within you know their crew and just like other people bands that they would play with that just don't have that diy mentality um, yeah, when it comes yeah. to like you know setting up their own shit like doing all of that so i'm just curious from your perspective if there's, if there's anything where you're like oh like this is just normal this is a normal way that i carry myself because of hardcore and that's a good thing because no one else does that or if yeah. there's an other side to that where it's like oh that actually like i have to humble myself a little bit here um, well, there's a lot of things I've done, like when I was modeling or uh, when I was helping shoot video for some people, uh, I think the stuff, I think actually being in hardcore made me more grateful for how, how things were handled in those situations. Because, all right, for instance, the DJ, like all I have to do is pull up to, like, pull up to the party, plug in my like USB and then like obviously perform really well and then just like leave like i'm, I'm like not <laughs> used to that at all like yeah instead I'm, of drum I'm cases so, and symbols and stands yeah i'm so used to things being like really austere and like you know the fact that the norm is to obviously when the dj comes you get them a hotel and you give them a welcome it's like a really there's a standard you know what i mean that that should be met especially um here in europe that they really like take it serious mm -hmm. and uh that's something that i am like okay like, I wish it was a little, like, I wish that it was a little better for, like, hardcore bands because it's, like, it's really austere to be in a band at this time. And it, But but that also, for me, it, I think, I'm going on the way I'm here, I think being in hardcore band and touring just made me grateful for all of the things, all the times that things can just be nice. Because I think I'm always so used to things being hard mm. and being like, well, this might not work, we got to think about this. But it also just made me a, a better finesser. Like, I... I can put up with austerity is way better, you know, if, if the, my flight gets canceled or if this happens or I have to, I don't know, just finessing through life. I think mm -hmm. that's from where I come from, uh, being from a Puerto Rican family and learning to survive since we were young, like, I don't know, just, yeah. uh, it's, it's, na it's just natural for me. Um, so it seems like problem solving, I, like, that's the thing where it's like, l like not getting mixed up and like feeling upset about a situation and just how do we problem solve this but at the same time yeah. like you're, you're maybe over problem solving problems that don't even exist exactly like i'm okay. always thinking like three steps ahead like, oh what if the promoters are paying me or blah, 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 blah. you yeah. know i'm always thinking about how it could be like really hard and i'm really glad that i had the experience of touring with the hardcore band first because it it makes all other touring that can make me be on another level really smooth you know what i mean sure, sure. it's like dude we have like a place to sleep and shower like this is nuts like yeah. you know like jesus peace just started getting on a level where we're able to afford some like hotels and stuff so when we have a hotel it's like whoa like this is kind of crazy <laughs> <laughs> yeah like i don't know it's nuts and like mm -hmm. like my, my my girl came on tour with us in europe for a couple of days and she's like holy shit you guys have to drive six hours every day <laughs> and like they didn't like they didn't like get you the hotel like right. they didn't like you know i'm like no i mean it's kind of what it's it's a, it's hard to be in a band it's 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 definitely it takes more than it gives sometimes but mm -hmm. like physically uh but you know but the the feeling of it is uh it's something that uh, can't be replaced mm -hmm. i don't know so there's no there's no dj said that has the energy i mean that's not true it's that she said some really fun but it does not the same energy like there's nothing that beats like a, a real 
good hardcore show. There's no energy in the whole world. Like I think that everyone should experience it one time, mm-hmm. even just as like an attendee, just to like just yeah, see it. It's totally. like yo, like that's nuts. Yeah, like that's straight. Like it's beautiful. Like we just played a, a show in New York at this uh, for our collab with Noah, and um, you know my girl brought her one of her good friends who's never been to anything like that, and she's just on stage like going nuts, and it's just. I don't know. When you think you've seen it all, like you could probably, as for life in general, you think you've seen it all, just try to explore something and maybe you find something that you never thought you'd maybe find yourself in. Mm-hmm. And that's kind of my my policy for life in general. I found myself in a lot of different places in the last couple of years. And people think like, wow, you're so involved in so many things. It's like, no, I really just took steps towards things that I've always loved. I was just like, well, let's see what I can make of this. Mm-hmm. <laughs> And just kind of just gain experience with that. I view you as someone that chases that that indulges in chasing curiosities and doesn't think about yeah. if I do this, I have to do it forever. It's like, no, hey, no, no. I'm gonna like film like some little like DIY movies on my on my camera, and I might do that for eight months, and then it's not that I if I set that down, I'm never gonna do it again. But now I'm gonna be focusing on on doing this, so. It's been entertaining at the very basic form, at least for me to like, you know, not only like your band, but also get to see so many different sides of you and just to see you just like um, play around and not be afraid to like put stuff out like when it comes to your creative process. I think that's been really cool. No, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, but every everything I've done in my life, I've I've loved to do since I was young. I think modeling was the only thing that I've pursue like kind of pursue that i was like a little uh shy about just because i never really looked at myself like that but like filming like being able to like take like little skate videos i was doing or filming like things for like you know just tour videos and then be- then taking that to another level to be able to like make a skate video for travis scott and i don't know film like like stuff for like like fa- like fashion brands and stuff like that it's like okay well <laughs> if you li- literally all you have to do is just kind of take the step to do what you love to do and like be like well what if i just put myself out there a little bit mm-hmm. but not in a, not but i i'm not the, i i am physically incapable of putting myself out there in a way where it's like i can't be myself you know i have to i ha- I, I have to just have that foundation where i'm like okay well at least where i'm here at least all i have in this situation is that i can be me you know what i mean i don't have to like uh talk a certain way or be a certain way or anything like that so i don't know yeah i appreciate you saying that uh, you know, it's, it's been really, it's been an interesting last couple of years, like being able to uh, find the confidence to just kind of go out and explore other things than just, than just hardcore, yeah. you know, and I, and I've been able to carry that, the hardcore, uh, I guess, foundation in my heart everywhere I go. Yeah. Here, here's an interesting uh, question. If you had, if the world froze for one hour every day but you're the only one who is able to to move around and and do stuff like kind of like uh i don't know if you've seen the movie click before but yeah yeah yeah. think think about it that way what's like that one dedicated hour that you would um what how would you utilize that extra hour that you would have compared to anyone else for any specific creative thing would it be drumming would it be like um doing more djing um electronic stuff like is is there something that you just like oh i just don't have time to do that but if you had that one extra hour compared to everyone else would you be doing that more i think i would sit there and be in the moment for an hour oh i think that I would, okay. I would legit do that because something that i'm doing or trying to be more uh uh present of is just learning to relax mm. and uh because I, I really formed my life especially in the last 10 years of just Bam, 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 everything. Like, it has to be nonstop. Like, what am I? I just finished this project. Now what? Now what? Now what? No, yeah. I'm going to move. I'm going to do this. I'm going to move to this country. I'm going to move to that. I'm going to do this. I'm gonna, I want to tour. I want to do this. I got to get involved. I, uh, I'm not really a social person in regards to like hitting people up or like hanging out and stuff, but I love to be doing something with my hands or, you know, connecting with people with through music or I don't even know, just at a record store, like digging or being online thinking, you know, and my girl always tells me all the time, like, you need just like, just, do you know how to relax? Like we're on vacation right now and I can see you're like on edge, like thinking like, okay, should we go do something? Should we do that? Should we do this? And, uh, yeah, I think that I need to like, just slow down sometimes because you really start to, 
forget about some of the good things like uh getting another hour of sleep or <laughs> or just having a moment with yourself or just having a, a, a moment of being alone or just hearing I don't know, just very simple things uh, mm. I'm like I'm a little nuts like where I hate to say that about myself but I'm a little nuts when it comes to like what I when I'm driven to do because it's more preferable to not eat or sleep and to to be able to do what I want to do like often people will be like damn like well I have work so I can't do that I'm like well dude like edit after work or do this after work like let's let's go I can make it work I'll fly to Paris for two days and come right back and go to work like if I'm able to do something I think that if you want something and you and you're and you're driven to do it, you gotta, you have to be austere. You have to make sacrifice. There's, there's no easy way, mm. no matter what. Even if you have all the money in the world, there's no easy way. You'll get opportunity, but if you don't have it and you don't have what it takes, you don't have that in your mind, then, or you don't have that drive, then you won't go anywhere. Mm. I've seen a lot of people who have a lot of money or come from, come from a lot of good things, and they don't, they don't do anything with it because they don't have that, that, that drive. You gotta, you gotta be hungry for it. And sometimes I think I'm a little too intense with that and i could i need to learn to, to chill out so if i had an hour every extra day i would definitely spend a an hour off my phone uh not listening to any music right uh not not touching any equipment and just kind of maybe just take a walk hmm. and just, just uh, uh seeing everyone else who's just frozen in time <laughs> yeah yeah and just being like I got, I yeah. got an hour to breathe. I got an hour to relax. Now we can go back on go mode. Yeah. Well, honestly, that is not the answer I thought I was going to get, but like way <laughs> better of a, of a response because I feel the exact same way. I, I compare myself to like when I heard that sharks don't stop swimming ever. And if they mm. do, it's, it, they die. Um, yeah. I'm like, that's how I feel. I feel like I'm yeah. constantly on the go. I constantly have something to do or something that I'm behind on or something that I need to attend to. And whether it's, uh, a, like a, an actual weekend or we're on vacation, it's like, I can't sit still. And it's yeah. like that deteriorates into my, in my romantic relationship. It goes into my, my friendships as well. I've talked to, um, uh, Matt from Citizen when he came on about this and we both were just like trying to like you know try to, we're almost trying to hold each other accountable now to like not being so overboard when it comes to just being on the go all the time um, right at the same time though like I'm someone that like I like when when Matt and I were talking about it my struggle is if I am not doing something within that day where I can look back, you know, when I go to bed as far as like, what did I do to move this, the needle of all the cool shit that I want to do in my life, just even slightly forward. I feel like, well, what was the point of me living today? Like that's how uh, intense yeah. it gets for me. Uh, yeah. I, I, I'm in the same way. I'm actually at a point now where if this sounds a little extreme, but if Jesus peace were to end today, I'd be satisfied. I don't care. Because we've done everything that we wanted to do, but we're excited to take it to another place and another level. It's almost like a new chapter for us. Mm -hmm. If someone was like, oh, well, the band has to end, I'd be like, okay, well, I'm going to keep going. Like, it doesn't end <laughs> sure. there. That's, that's yeah, yeah. the thing. Like, I, I, I think that it's it's not important to me on what level that we do it. It's more important that we're doing it or we're doing something. Mm -hmm. And uh, and no matter what, I'm going to I'm gonna keep going. I, I, like you said, I, I will die if I'm not doing something like that that drives me. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah, so um, I'm ready to the other side of the coin though, uh, at least for me is one of my favorite quotes is like, if you want things you've never had, you need to do things you've never done. So it's like, exactly. you need to like, yeah. you know, I've never flown to Paris just for two days to do this one little project, but like, yeah. that sounds like something that I should do. And that's something that's like in my gut. So I have, I have to, like, it becomes like. I don't need to, or I want to, it's, I have to. So yeah, it becomes this thing where it's like every, everything growth wise that has happened for me has been like me doing the unconventional things than any of my other, you know, friends that maybe aren't as driven, um, are doing, but there's a balancing act obviously to all those things to be able to be content with what you've done. And, you know, whether right. it's that day, that week, that year, um, and trying to, because I'm the same way. It's like, I think I think everyone listening, the answer should be if you have an extra hour, have a nap, uh, you know, get some fresh air, you know, do something yeah. that isn't uh, with a screen in front of your face. So that's yeah. uh, 
that's very wise of you to say. Well, yeah, yeah, it's uh, it's definitely something I I think about all the time. But I also, I also, I know I talk to my friends about this all the time. And like, if you want this for your life, you have to make it your life. If you want this to be more than a hobby, you have to make it more than a hobby. Mm-hmm. And uh, people often question, like, damn, bro, well, like, you know, you're putting your job on the line. I'm like, yeah, well, I'm, thankfully, I'm graced with like the finesse or the little, you know, the little bit of I guess, street smarts to make things work for myself. Like, I never thought I'd be able to live in Brooklyn and be able to work at Noah sometimes and they you know they allow me to tour and do what i what i have to do and they and you know shout out to them they really support my my life so um you know not everyone is able to do that there's some people who live in new york and have to work their their asses off at a job they can be working anywhere else for cheaper you know mm-hmm. and you know so i really take the every day with uh you know as i'm grateful for that because i could be in a situation where i can't do any of my stuff because i have to provide for someone or someone or myself and thankfully everything is i've i've I give myself the credit to forcefully put everything in place where I'm able to uh, do what I have to do or do what I want to do and at least give myself a shot to to pursue something that I am driven by or that I love. Mm-hmm. Uh, I never went to school or anything. So, hey, you only have this life, so you have to go for it. <laughs> as corny as it is, straight up, though. Like, it's mm-hmm. like, it really, you got to find that confidence. Yeah. Um, I, fl- oh, sorry, I cut you off there. No, I was gonna say to at least like learn to fall on your ass and be, hum- be humble and like even start over or whatever, whatever yeah. it takes. Yeah, and if anything, like if you're starting from like I turned thirty a-, a few days ago, and I literally have thought about like, okay, I've done this much when it comes to scoped or my own music ventures in the last five to you know like scoped is is five e- five and a half now, and then I've been mm-hmm. playing bands for almost ten years, but it's like the next decade of my life with all that experience, like how crazy could it get? Like, that's the mindset that I'm trying to go into. This yeah, we'll so see. Well. You, know, you might even find yourself in places you never thought. Like I, I never thought I would model, for instance, never. Mm-hmm. That's not something. I never even thought I'd move to New York. I hate New York. I, I hated New York. And now I'm a, now I'm a resident there. I'm not, I'm not from there. I'm re- just visiting. And I, <laughs> I, uh, cause I hate when people are like, Oh, I live in New York. I'm from New York. Like, no, I'm not. I'm yeah. from Pennsylvania. Mm-hmm. And I'm, uh, I'm, I'm a spectator of New York living amongst people right. trying to, trying to live within the craziness there. But, um, yeah, there's a lot of things I never thought I'd, I'd, I'd do, but yeah. I, I got to do it. Um, I wanted to go back to, you brought up, um, how everyone at some point, whether you like heavy music or not, should go to a hardcore show because like, yeah, a, like a good hardcore show, like where there's, yeah it's the room is packed people are hyped um the energy in the room is infectious um something i noticed um when i started to see you doing more like modeling stuff is either you would drop um a story or a picture of you showing someone else usually a a large celebrity a hate five six video of some kind so I, i wanted to ask who do you think either a had the the most interesting response to seeing that when you know you're in between shoots or, or whatever uh but also who was like the biggest person and you're like texting sunny immediately like i just showed one of your videos to fill in the blank uh i don't know it's hard it's weird to say but um because they all kind of have different responses like uh like travis saw my travis got saw my band because of my roommate at the time he showed him the band. So I, I, I was indirectly, I was in the room, but he showed him it and he was like, that shit's fire. And <laughs> um, Charlie XCX, when I got to play for her, she just, I didn't even know she saw it. She just came up to me and was like, oh, I just saw the video of your band and I want to come to your show when you come to London. So I was like, okay. So like, I didn't show her, but the only person I actually did like physically show was Dennis Rodman. And Yes, that's who it was. Yeah, yeah. And uh, he was like, um wow do you like the band rush (laughs) that's the only comparison that he could make to it i I was like i I honestly never really listened to rush but he was like yeah i think you maybe like if you you play like this you might like that i was like okay did you check out rush after um no i didn't (laughs) (laughs) i don't know i don't i just know jesus peace to rush that there's some connection, but there's multiple bands in between those two to to make that happen. It was like Rush, and then he said something else, 
Oh, I told him I was from Allentown, Pennsylvania. He said there was another band that they used to play there, and he would go see them there in Allentown all the time. He said, mm. "I was like, okay, but yeah, that was uh, that was his response." Well, shout out to funny, Rush, funny if they're listening. <laughs> <laughs> maybe go on tour, Jesus Peace. Um, yeah. So I think maybe one of the the last you know things that kind of connects these two worlds that we've talked about the Jesus Peace hardcore and the electronic stuff, like where do you see like do you try to silo those drumming styles into like their unique boxes or do you like intentionally try to connect some of those um stylistic things whether it's like you know different snare progressions or like different tones for like your your bass shit like is there anything that you're like intentionally trying to connect those things or you're like this is my hardcore stuff and this is my electronic stuff uh, they're already connected. I mean, uh, all everything I write for Jesus Peace is never influenced by another band. It's usually influenced by, like for this last album, I took a lot of patterns from um, like footwork style. Um, I, if you guys ever checked out like DJ Earl or DJ Rashad, he's there's like these Chicago DJs that made this uh, or kind of perfected this sound called footwork. Hmm. And you'll hear it in some of the breakdowns. I just straight up just took the rhythm and put it as a breakdown instead of like as a dance track. Oh, okay. And um, yeah, I'm really influenced by all sorts of uh, North African rhythm or uh, some of my favorite producers are from like Nairobi or different parts of Africa. Um, I don't know. I'm always always influenced by different uh, world sounds. So and like the rhythms they did. I used to live in a Hare Krishna temple and I, I learned to play like a drum there called Mar- Mardunga and so they have all sorts of different rhythms I've always just been influenced by sounds of, of percussion or music in general hmm. uh, since I was young um, so I always try to time into each other because I'm trying to p- push the drumming in a way where I think could be interesting or music in a way that could be interesting um, and with Jesus Peace we're all they, they really support I mean Dave is a really big lover of electronic as well and so we're always down to work with producers or I don't know. I think it's going to, I think we'll, we'll progress in a, in a way where I don't want to say too much, but I think we'll do some more things with electronic things. It depends mm. if it's good, if, if it's good for sure, but we don't want to force it if it's not. Yeah. Um, but I, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that they're all, they're pretty inner, inner, uh, interjected like musically speaking but otherwise I think that I'm always bringing Jesus piece with me everywhere I go for electronic because I think people are really interested that someone is in a hardcore band electronic because it's not often mm-hmm. so I'm definitely proud to come from hardcore and electronic music because I think it's like as you said earlier there's a foundation and enough and a kind of a thought process that's different and it's uh, something that can be brought new to the table but at the same time I um I like to, I think a lot of kids, there's been a lot more hardcore kids who have uh, been branching, they've messaged me and stuff saying that they have been more open to listening to electronic music or going to shows or uh, parties and stuff like that. And it's not for everyone. And so I think in that way, I really don't try to force to cross it because I don't want people to feel that they have to like something. It's it's straight up, hardcore is not for everyone and electronic is not for everyone. Right. I think there's just, you have, you have to have that, uh, that intro that maybe can spark it for you. Mm-hmm. So whatever that may be for you, I don't know. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think I heard on uh, one of your other interviews is like um, there's certain electronic music that isn't as hard um, in America. I think, I, I hope that I'm quoting that correctly, but um, with your heavy music background, like um, does that connect with a lot more people when you're playing like, you know, where, where you're at right now versus uh in america like i'm I'm just i'm a little bit noobish when it comes to some of the electronic scene kind of stuff so like i don't oh, know right. if like yeah. the heavy side of that is like ooh, i don't know or if it's specific where you go no I, i'm not really playing that much heavy electronic music to be honest i, I was when i first started because i love hardcore and gabber so much mm-hmm. <clears throat> but then i found it to be kind of boring to play hard all the time um but uh, I think there's a there's a niche for everything everywhere you go. I mean, Europe is definitely there's just a more a, just a bigger culture for electronic music in Europe, mm-hmm. which is funny because the history of electronic music is definitely the origins techno are coming from Chicago and Detroit and house music, and then obviously like craft work and everything from Germany. But uh, but for for the culture and respect of it, like for sure, like Europe is super like there's but there's 
like as I said, there's a niche for everything. There's, uh, there's some hardcore guys here called Casual Gabbers who are like leading like kind of like the more modern like hardcore. Uh, I guess like Pocket in France, and then there's. I don't know. There's something for everything. There's a whole experimental scene here. With these guys who are making like sound designing some of the craziest stuff I ever heard, but bringing it into a club setting, which is like, mm-hmm. uh, I love that. Um, yeah, I don't know. I know in America though, we have it's a bit smaller. You could really only play like, I mean, you could play anywhere, but um, uh, the biggest places are obviously like New York and like Miami and uh, Chicago. Mm. Uh, I think there's some shows in Detroit. I just played in Portland and it's so this is funny. I just played in Portland with my girl and the dude running it. It's literally a hardcore show, but electronic. Like they do everything themselves. They brought a huge sound system. It's, it's in a, it's like an abandoned spot and they had us come, but it was, you know, a level of profession. It's not like a fried kid running it. It's a, <laughs> a, kid, a kid named George from, from Portland. He's, he did a really good job. And, um, I don't know. I, I appreciated that because everything how it was ran was very, uh, very much like a punk or hardcore show. Like hmm. It was just like, you know, keep it under wraps. Uh, you know, uh, there's like no security or anything like that. It's just very much just like a just like a party, but everyone's there to like dance and see music and whatever they do. Any extracurriculars is up to them, but right. um, but you know, uh, everything else just seemed like a hardcore show to me because mm-hmm. it was just different music, yeah, and a different energy, obviously. But yeah, yeah, yeah. That's always interesting to to you know, to, to, to realize that like, oh, just because it's so like 24, seven, 365, when it comes to how we do like hardcore things nowadays, there's still like scenes and other places that can do that, but maybe it's just not as common or, you yeah. know, um, it's not as talked about because for us, we're like, we pride ourselves. We're like, we set up in the middle of nowhere and we had a <laughs> generator and other people were just like, Oh yeah. Like, it's just what we had to do, you know, or it's just normal. So, um, yeah, that's always, that's what, yeah, that's a funny thing. I mean, there's a whole culture here in France called like, uh, like free tech and free parties. And it's these guys who live in trucks and, uh, uh, they live off of like setting up their sound systems and that's like, oh, that's wow. literally their life. Think think like uh, like crust punks, but they have they are specializing in sound. Interesting. Okay. And and they have like very very like uh, low key parties in the woods, but like thousands of people are going. It's it's nuts. Damn, that's one <laughs> way to make your bag. You just drive around in a truck <laughs> and fucking rent out your sound system for a thousand but, person party. I mean, I I'm not sure that they're renting it out all the time. But they really pride themselves on how they how it's built. And sometimes there'll be totally. festivals like, yeah. oh, this tent is like this uh, this system, and this is this system, and uh, okay, I don't know. Yeah. yeah. But also at the same time, speaking on like how hardcore's ran, I don't know if you've been seeing this. Probably like too late in the convo to start talking about it now, but everything is changing. Like <laughs> everything is changing now. Everything it's it's whether we like to admit it or not, and I think that's why people are becoming more defensive about hardcore, like and keeping its origins, is that it's becoming a mainstream thing. Mm-hmm. It literally is. Slowly and surely, it is. Uh, it's like like the fact that I he, I'm hearing that there's a lot of kids coming to hardcore shows because they found out about TikTok. There's a lot more sponsorships in hardcore now. There's a lot more. Uh, I don't know. I think it's it's interesting to see where it's going. Mm-hmm. Um, I guess that's a whole other topic, but yeah, because everyone's saying it's like, oh, it's an underground thing, it's an underground thing, and it still is, but now it's becoming to a point where it's like, okay, well, at what point is, isn't it? You know, and what's the what's the limit in that? Yeah, I think yeah, I think we could spend another hour talking about uh, yeah. that that topic specifically, but I do think that um, my opinion is that if those purely DIY things are still happening, but the you know, exception is the 5,000 person, um, show in, um, for sound and fury, but still that festival being set up in a very DIY way. It's not like sound and fury brought to you by Coca-Cola or, or anything no, like that. No, 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 no but, not at all. No, 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 no. But I do think that, you know, innovation and elevation of whatever thing that we're doing, like, I think, I encourage that because I look at that as like base hits to bring more kids to shows, having right. bands be able to, you know, go on tour without it being like, we're just trying to break even every single night. Like, right. I, I hope that things, I, I don't want to just sit here and say, I want hardcore to be mainstream. I just want hardcore to continue to 
organically grow and attract new people and for the right. music and all those things to still be true to the culture. Um, well, I'm not... that, yeah, that's the whole balance. Yeah. That's the whole, that's the whole balance of uh, what the, that's the argument here. Cause I agree with you. I, I do like things to be pushed. I do want kids to be coming to shows. I don't think it's interesting to, to play the same tours over and over again and the same shows over and over again. Cause you're just going to be playing for the same people over and over again. And it's like, well, damn, like, you know, I want the scene to grow and I want things to progress. But, you know, at what point isn't it the foundation of hardcore anymore? At what right. point is it, is it just like every other genre? You know what I mean? But, but it's, you know, it's like, you know, you got Cardi wearing death metal shirts, uh, everybody, you know, rappers and everybody really uh, kind of cashing in on this like alternative look. And it's like, well, yeah, obviously they don't know shit about anything. But at the same time, it's like a, a lot of bands who are pouring and playing with bands like that, which is are people like that. And it's great. And it's cool, and I love doing it. Mm -hmm. I, I think it's awesome. Like we're we're playing Outbreak Festival with Denzel Curry and all these other uh, like Death Grips and stuff like that. And that's a that lineup I'd never I'd never thought I'd see. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? But like, but here we are. And I, now I feel like there's no limit to what hardcore can do. Right. But I guess the argument the argument now, and this is why I don't uh, I don't necessarily disagree when people are really defensive about hardcore, is because that you know when at what point isn't it? You know. You know, because I, I do think there's uh, there's levels to it. And mm -hmm. uh, I know it's just an interesting thing to think about. But yeah. I, I, I as, as you said, I love, sorry. No, that's I fine. love to, uh, I love to see the progression. I, I love to be out there. Uh, I, I love to be the the oddball oddball band on the tour. Like when we got to do like the, the ghost main, like that, that little thing we did with him was like really interesting. And it brought, there's a lot of kids who come, still come to our show and are like, oh, I saw you on that thing. And it made me start going to shows. Mm -hmm. And that to me is special. You know, it's cool to see like people being introduced to something real. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's like, um, I think any, I understand why people go to defend because hardcore means so much to them and, and, and everyone listening to this podcast, like they care about it. So when something mm -hmm. is pushing, you know, that's pushing on something that people are passionate about. So I think it's okay. Like, let's look at that singular thing and, and have a discussion about it. It's like, you know, like, mm. I don't think violence at shows should ever go away because certain people like don't fuck with that. You know, if they right. came through the TikTok um, pipeline, but right. um, I like, I look at things like um, knowing full well that when Blink-182 and Turnstile are doing a tour together and there might very well be a Kardashian, wow. like the Kardashians camera crew who are following, you know, Travis Barker and like, kind of like, I'm sure the producers like, well, people are going crazy during this turnstile band and maybe want to like get a couple shots. And maybe someone does that. Does that mean that like turnstile is like, like watering down hardcore by the fact that no, there's going to be so yeah, many no, people no. who are going to start coming to like the FYAs that this is hardcore because they went to, they saw Turnstile when they went to maybe originally see Blink-182 and right. it's like a, it's like a filtration system of like, yeah, there will be people that listen to the music. They don't like it. And then they'll come to a local show. They won't like it. And then that core, you know, the cream of the crop of all those people could be the people to go start the next Jesus piece, knock loose level bands um, in yeah. time. So yeah. I, I try to just be optimistic, but I also try to air, I understand why people, you know, yeah. rush to, Ooh, I don't know about this. <laughs> no, no, yeah, I'm with you. I'm with you 100%. I love to see, uh, I love to see, I also like to be nervous too. I think it's good. It's a good feeling to be like, oh, I don't know where this is going to end up, where it's going to go. Shit can go south. You know, the scene, everything can be jeopardized. But hey, I mean, as long as we know we're going to be here regardless, and that's, I don't think we have anything to be afraid of. But I, I really love to see progression in, in, in music regardless. Right. Uh, Lou, this has been a fantastic conversation with you. I have one more question before we start to wrap up the show. And okay. I end this with every single podcast guest that comes on. Tell me a favorite Mosh-related story that you would like to end on. And that's anything that comes first to your head. Could be wholesome, could be gruesome, uh, could be a Jesus Peace story, could be a uh, just at a random show you were attending. Whatever's first to your dome is how we start to end the combo. I don't even know. There's like the moshing is such a complex. We could do a whole podcast on moshing. To be honest, it's something I I'm have considered really... doing a mosh story call in episode. Um, but uh, yeah, 
I, I, I think that it's le- like the stories are one thing, but it, to me, it's about like the, I really think I'm going to put this on paper on your podcast. I do think that there should be an archivist of talking about the different uh, evolutions and styles within the world of moshing. Because one thing mm. that I've been graced with was to be able to see and travel all the different styles that people are taking from. Like for instance, like Japan has definitely a New York influence, but they have like their own Japanese like style. You know what I mean? I mean, there's like the classic savagery style videos and the urban, I think it's called like urban 47, like beatdown videos. And then like, you got like New York in like the time where like, um, I don't know, Billy Club Sandwich and everybody was doing their thing in that time. And then before that, when you, you watch Bad Brains and how people were moshing then, and like kind of the evolution, but like people don't realize that in LA, it's kind of, it's kind of different. And in, in France and Europe in general, like it's, have, they have their own style. I don't know. It's that to me is the first thing that comes to my mind, but a funny story. Um, honestly the first thing that comes to my head is when we toured with japan in japan we brought this dude uh cory the singer of move yep you know Corey. He's, he's been on the show um, before yeah uh he is known for being like a very aggressive person but he's like he's a he's a sweetheart he has mm-hmm. a huge heart but he's extremely aggressive and like he's just like a big dude you know what i mean and he has like he was like famous for doing like front flips on stage and stuff yep when bands were playing and like there was even kids in Japan doing that, which is, I thought that was awesome. But I think we were, I think, I don't know where we played, like a suburb of Osaka, I think. Um, and we like, we were all going really hard. We got to play with this band called Cruelty. And we were like, fuck it, let's just all like, Cruelty with a K, like, right? Like, yeah. And yeah. we were like, let's just all pit like super hard, like, fuck it. And I, I don't think it's that interesting to be just like hit people. I think that you have no style if you just hit like your only goal is to just be like, I don't know, just hitting people for no reason. If you're going to do it, at least do it with finesse or have some swag. Mm -hmm. That's how I look at it. But uh, we were going, like, pretty hard, and it was fun. But I guess one of the promoters called our tour manager and was like, hey, like, there's a lot of kids and, like, people complaining about how you guys were moshing here in Japan. (laughs) And we would like, at the next show, you can, like, tone it down. Mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure that's – I think that's what they said. And I thought that was just, like, really – I thought it was endearing. I thought it was cool. But – um. Yeah, that's pretty much. I don't really know, have that many like. Well, I mean, there's a lot of stories of moshing, but right. I just like to do it. Yeah, that, that, that's my main thing. I love to do it, and I do think, I do think, if not me, someone should do take my idea, should archive the origins of moshing, but like from different styles though, because I there's there's not just one. If you really know yeah, moshing, you know there's totally. not just one. It's, like it's Delco, like, it, it needs to be a roundtable discussion with Corey, with Fubu Man, with um. Yeah, there needs to be all the 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 famous moshers of our scene all talking about uh, but, that. But from an those educational people now space. are are not even the ones. Like, look at any Delco hardcore video in like two thousand seven, like, or any New Jersey video from like that age, or I don't even know Philly Philly in two thousand. This dude, the singer of Payback, his name is Keith. Mm-hmm. In 2000, 2010 or 11, I still remember him. He, he, the way he moshed was unlike anyone I've ever seen, and I was terrified of him. Hmm. And but it was not in a violent way. It was in a very. It was in a way that he had just finesse and beauty on the day. It was like ballet. You know, <laughs> that to me is way more impressive. I'm not really interested in how hard you could hit someone or this. Right. If you have a finesse or or you are just acrobatic or you just look badass, that to me is. Wow. it's a, it's wow. amazing. So somebody somebody archive this stuff because No, I I think that's a potentially million dollar idea uh, as far as yeah, creating well, a archive yeah. or some kind of um piece of content to talk about the uh the styles uh from that we all partake in. Um Lou, again, this has been a really fun convo. I'm really excited to see Jesus pieces coming back with new music. Um Thanks man the the one single that i've at least heard as far as the time of recording this episode has been crazy um so you know the term sleeping dragon is one that i always like to use where it's like bands that kind of like don't do a lot and they kind of like stay quiet for a little bit and then just come back with this like just menacingness to them so (laughs) that's been really cool to see i'm excited to see the rest of it Hell yeah. That, I mean, that was the, that's, I feel like that's the most calm song on the, on the record for sure. It was one Damn, that we just, okay. uh, just 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That one's I'm really excited for everyone to see everything that we're doing. It's definitely another chapter. It's definitely another level of what we're able to do and just the beginning of what we can do. So um yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that we really took our time and I think it was worth it. I, I don't I don't see any reason to rush. Yeah. So with all that being said, all of your links to Jesus B stuff as well as your own personal music stuff will be in the description and the show notes. Anything you want to shout out, anything you want to send the people off with, or anything you want to say before we wrap up, the floor is yours. Uh, new Jesus B single. I think in like two, I don't know when this will be out, but I think it comes out like maybe January 20th. The video is going to be awesome. I can't wait for them to see it. Um, the album will be out in spring. Um, come see us on tour and send me your tracks if you start making electronic music I'm definitely interested in more kids who are getting involved in it mm -hmm. and um, hit me up I don't know Just, uh, <laughs> everybody stay safe absolutely yeah I'm, I'm oh, yeah. hoping you know if it's not that Vancouver Jesus Beast show and but it's something else um, I'm hoping that we get to um cross paths in person soon soon the later but yeah, yeah, again for sure. thanks for coming on the pod this was really really fun dude yeah thanks for having me